Throughout this semester, we've all learned about easily solvable problems and very difficult problems. We started with naive and kind of ineffective approaches and worked our way up to surprisingly easy to understand heuristics. Working with the traveling salesman problem was fun, but it didn't really feel like it was applicable to everyday life. And the same felt true of many common NP problems like on the Wikipedia list, that is until I read about the facility location problem. So the facility location problem or FLP can be best explained with an analogy. You can start by imagining a common business and it doesn't really matter what. It could be food service or the automotive business or entertainment, clothing, toys, I don't know, even fraud. I, all of these businesses are supposed to make and sell products. They usually have suppliers and or distributors. And of course, sometimes, I don't know, they're a monopoly on the cusp of taking over the world. But regardless, each of these businesses strive to minimize costs and maximize profit. So how would a new business go about deciding where to put a central facility or multiple facilities? To phrase it a bit more succinctly, FLP is a clustering problem. Client points connect to their nearest facility and the function cost is determined by the total or average distance in the entire universe of client facility relationships. For the sake of simplicity, we're assuming a couple things. Number one, distance will be drawn as the crow flies in a two-dimensional Euclidean plane. Number two, a given number of facilities is already budgeted for, so the act of creating a facility doesn't cost anything. And number three, this is the uncapacitated facility sharing problem. In real life, facilities have a finite number of resources and they can disappear like toilet paper in the midst of a pandemic. That's the capacitated version. Here, that's not really our concern. So we'll say that there are infinite resources. And so a facility can take care of any number of clients. The facility location problem is reducible to a vertex cover problem, which is one of CARP's 21 NP complete problems. So the exact solution is NP hard. And academia has shown a variety of methods to achieve sufficiently optimal solutions, such as minimax integer programming, case center approximations, and a plethora of heuristics, you know, greedy, interchange, dual descent, linear relaxation, and many more. Based off the knowledge obtained in this class, I decided to take an approach to this problem with a good old genetic algorithm implemented entirely in Python. In the analogy to molecular biology, a facility can be thought of as a gene and its coordinates the nucleotides. The configuration of all facilities on a given map is akin to a full chromosome. All these individuals make up a population, and populations are bred throughout time for a number of generations. So, let's dig into the magic. The initial population is created from pure random sampling across the bounds of the client coordinates. At this generation, the facility locations are basically like darts being blindly thrown, and in most cases, it's going to be terrible. The fitness function then needs to determine total distances, and for one facility that's trivial to iteratively calculate. But for multiple facilities, each facility should only supply the clients whose distance is absolutely minimized. To solve for that, each client calculates its distance to all possible facilities, and in this algorithm in particular, a tiny bit of performance is saved in this step by skipping the square root operation in the distance formula since it's not really necessary to compare which distance is greater or smaller. Instead, the route is only taken after all routes have been established, and then from there, a cumulative total is easy. A smaller total distance needs to imply a better fitness, so the final fitness score is determined by taking the distances inverse. With all distances calculated for all individuals in the population, it's time to make babies. If enabled, a definite number of the most elite individuals will always be selected. The rest of the mating pool is then decided with the remaining individuals picked randomly, where each individual has a higher chance of being picked if they're more fit. And uh, after getting cozy in the bedroom, you know, two parents generate a new individual with random genes from each. And the way that works is I programmed it to start with a random subset of a random length from one parrot, and then the remaining spots are filled in from the unique bits from the other parent. And at this point, 
the new child's almost ready to start life. However, if the wisdom of the crowd's heuristic is enabled, some, uh, friendly eugenicists to say, come in and force a random gene to be whatever is most prominent in the previous generation. It's kind of like when your parents force you to play outside like their generation did instead of spending an unhealthy amount of time on the computer. But luckily, that's where mutation comes in, which might be the most progressive step in the model. By chance, a newborn facility might get dropped on its head. Sometimes that makes them suffer for their entire lives, and other times it makes them a prodigy or gives them superpowers or something. The same general concept actually applies here. The X and Y components of the facility are altered based on a normal distribution function. The mean of the distribution is the component's original value, and the standard deviation is a homemade expression. I didn't want the variance to be some constant, because the graph could be on any scale. It could be 0.1 all the way up to 100 units apart. I ended up taking the range of client values for each component and dividing that by the number of clients. I've called that result the resolution because it roughly defines the smallest useful unit of measurement for a uniform client distribution. That gets passed to the normal distribution, which was picked to allow for chaos to be introduced without movement that sends a facility all the way across the map. The new generation will get unmutated elites from the previous generation, if enabled, and this process gets repeated by however many generations the user inputted. The variables at each step are parameters, actually. The number of facilities, population size, number of elites, mutation rate, number of generations, and whether or not the wisdom of the crowd's meta heuristic is enabled. Now, after the number of desired generations is complete, the algorithm spits out a beautiful solution. In this example, you can see how the points tend to cluster really nicely. Each facility has been minimized nearly perfectly to the center of its group. So how does this stack up with various options? Well, it's extraordinarily similar to our TSP algorithms. You can intuitively guess what factors make a big performance hit, like population and generation sizes, and which ones make a hit on the efficiency and accuracy instead. In particular, I wanted to test a variety of data sets with and without the wisdom of the crowds. Just from playing around with a few variables, I somewhat arbitrarily chose the following constants. Three facilities, 20 individuals in each population, five elites carried over, a 50% mutation rate, and 250 generations as the stop condition. I didn't find any good presets available online that worked to my liking, so I made my own generator. As you can see here, a file is generated in nearly the same syntax as the TSP standardization. A number of clients and the bounds can be specified as well as an index or tendency to say, to make clusters in larger sets. And then I generated sets with 10, 30, 100, and 500 clients and used that for the remainder of testing. Each data set had four trials and two cases with everything else held constant. I ran these on my desktop computer which has an i7-8700K 12-core at 3.7 gigahertz processor and 16 gigabytes of memory. A program timer started directly before the algorithm started and immediately following the final generation, which was dumped along with the final distance in the command line. I recorded those two metrics to account for both performance and effectiveness of the algorithm and additionally calculated some other core statistical metrics to help me compare results. Most tests only took a few seconds, but I figured I had enough precision. To my surprise, I found that enabling wisdom of the crowds was actually worse than keeping it disabled, unlike our TSP experiments. The table on the left is the improvement going on from wisdom enabled to wisdom disabled. So the classical algorithm in this case performed nearly 12% better than the wisdom algorithm in this best case scenario, whereas the inverse is true for only 5% and that polarity seemed to grow with the data set used. The crazy range of standard deviations also shows how a few cases simply got stuck in a local minimum. And I would think that's why the bias introduced in Wisdom of the Crowds hurts a lot more than it helps. A visual breakdown of the average trial can be seen here. Nothing was too notable for only a few clients, but the distance was better minimized using the classic algorithm for larger sets like the 500. And with no surprise, the runtime didn't change a significant amount in any case.
even though these two had continuously different solutions, the general shapes they made were somewhat consistent within their own class. These are some sample screenshots for the 100 and 500 client sets. The leftmost column shows the clients without any calculations involved, and you can see how it's really clustered on the 500. The middle shows a wisdom of the crowd solution, and the right shows it disabled. You can clearly see how the distances were close, but the solutions for each took on an entirely different shape for each solution. Looking at the improvement curves, there wasn't really a huge difference. Each started with a large drop by fixing the random initial population, but then it kind of smoothed out in a similar fashion, usually coming close to the solution by generation 150. Other than that, we can't really tell much from these graphs alone. Nevertheless, I would call the program effective at getting a good solution. Now, I wanted to apply this to some real world data, but I wasn't able to find any documents that listed out store coordinates. I ended up looking up store locations manually for Micro Center Incorporated, which is a physical consumer electronics shop that didn't have the same terrible fate as Radio Shack. So the question is, how well can FLP apply? I plotted all the points based on real latitude and longitude locations, and then stretched a Mercator projection of the US to fit the points as best as possible to get an idea of where stores were. I know in reality, Micro Center takes parts from a bunch of different sources, but let's assume an executive asked you to just drop a pin where a central facility should go. Now, just by looking at this map, what would you think? Uh, the West doesn't really make much sense. You've got that one point in California there. Too far in the east and you're kind of neglecting everything in the midwest but here's where it gets real i hope you're wearing socks because i'm about to knock them off the program outputted a set of coordinates right near boom columbus ohio which makes the perfect intuitive sense i think what's more impressive is the fact that micro center's corporate headquarters are located just on the other side of the city that's incredible here's what that would look like for two or three facilities these locations make sense just by looking at them, but the NP hardness of the problem makes it nearly impossible to verify their ideal. Of course, real businesses have plenty more factors to worry about, but that goes way beyond the scope of this project. The facility location problem extends to a variety of sectors. Instead of just pointing at a map and saying, "Ah, that looks like a good spot, consider the implications of higher profits, lower emergency response times, better network latency, so on and so forth. Even the reduced version of FLP has many theoretical applications, which may help us understand PNNP, which in turn may help us understand the universe we're in and get us closer to knowing its creator. And that's just beautiful.